I'm Liz. And I'm Marie. And this is Mock It, a podcast sponsored by MetroStar, where we take a deep dive into UX design, trending design topics, and chatting with our friends in the field. Let's get started. So today we have an awesome topic, a call for explorers, journalists versus specialists. And today, Jason Stoner, the uh, MetroStar's Director of Experience Strategy, is joining us today. <laughs> so uh, you are an avid biker, a fanatic of anything mid-century modern, and a self-proclaimed generalist. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're super excited to have you. Yes, I am. It's great to be here. Uh, do you want to give a little bit of an intro about yourself for our listeners? Sure. Um, you know, if we start with being a self-proclaimed generalist, <laughs> you know, that is, uh, that is me. Um, I'm the first in my family that went to college. And when I told them that I wanted to be an artist, a designer, I saw the tears in their eyes. <laughs> and throughout the duration of my entire life since then, they've said, don't you want to take business classes uh, with that? Um, I never did. Um, that is a regret that I have. But going through college, I created my own curriculum um, at this school. I've created kind of my own path, you know, going through the design field, moving from where we grew up in Pennsylvania, looking at other states that had more of a design profession and opportunities to where I am today. And that's only done because of being a generalist and exploring the world around me. That's awesome. We've worked with you for a few years. I didn't know all of that. That's awesome. Uh, so as we start to get into this uh, episode of our podcast, can you give a little bit of a background on what a generalist is, a specialist is, and what an explorer is? Certainly. The topic of generalist versus specialist has been around for a long time. And specialist is pretty easy to understand. You have a field and you're able to know pretty much everything about it. But generalist has always had a negative connotation for me. And it's this Jack or Jill of all trades, master and none. And that never really sat well with me because when you look at the most people in the world, they're a generalist. They know a lot of different things, but it comes down to how do you pull that collective knowledge together to understand really the field that you're in and be able to um, you know, work on something that's a passion for you, but uh, leveraging that experience you know, that, you, that you have with it. So this kind of foundation of, or more of um, this anger that I've had around the word <laughs> generalist, um, you know, was the idea for coming up with the idea of an explorer, because that's what it is. When you look at the path for life, you're learning different things, you're at different points, um, you know, just in life, in your career, and you constantly build on um, what you learned previously. And that was the idea of an explorer for me. So it's building on that idea of a generalist, but being more positive and trying to be more motivational with it, that an explorer is somebody that can take all these different topics and bring them together um, to do something that they really believe in and make the world a better place. Nice. I love the concept of the explorer. It gives it like more um, direction where like mm -hmm. generalists is like, oh, it just kind of happened to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So then um, for those that are kind of just getting into like the, t the topics of uh, journalist ex uh, explorer and specialist, what are some like popular like pros and cons that people if you know, if they go online and research a little bit more about it. What are like the big things that they're going to see? Like, you know, don't be a specialist because of this or don't be a journalist because of this or like be a generalist because of this or be a specialist because of this. Right. There's a lot of information with pros and cons for both. You'll hear one article that says you need to be a specialist. Another one is a generalist. You'll make more money. Mm -hmm. You'll be more employable. But ironically, I was just in no less than three conversations in the past two weeks about this very topic. Uh, a couple of friends have kids that are going to college and they're asking them, what are you specializing in? Mm -hmm. When I look back to my career, I was an art major because I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> so it was kind of forced on me, but I still look to explore all the different aspects of what art and design had to offer before specializing in it. Um, so when you look at um, this topic of a generalist, you'll hear them be called a polymath. Um, generalist is another topic, and there's many more. 
But um, you, know, as I mentioned, it goes back and forth where um, you'll hear pros and cons about one versus the other. But um, when you look at any type of um, field there is, it takes more generalists to be able to do it. And those generalists, from what I've seen, are the ones that can connect the dots and put those pieces together, um, whether it's talking with different people to bring in different perspectives about what needs to be done, whether it's um, being able to understand what somebody's going through and what they're dealing with to come up with whatever um, that solution is. Um, it's the generalist that can do that and put those pieces together. And there's more people like that that are needed. So when I look at you know generalist versus specialist, we need both, but the world needs more generalists but there needs to be more focus around the word generalist. And you need to take this idea of exploring and be more active and deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're putting that plan into action, actually doing something with it. Awesome. Well, I mean, you kind of you kind of just touched on it with, um, you know, saying that you, you really like the idea of explorers. So mm -hmm. with that, um, why what's the difference between a generalist and an explorer? And why are explorers kind of like maybe what you actually want to potentially may actually want to be? <laughs> it's putting it's putting the action behind it. Uh, you, we've we've seen or we probably know people that are lifelong learners, mm -hmm. but they have trouble finding how to apply it. Um, they just they are always going to school. They're always learning, but they never quite find what's right for them. And for me, the explorer is more of uh, being able to take um, all that learning that they're doing and turn it into action and um, being able to find really what, um, what their passion is in life to apply all this learning that they've been doing. So I'd say it's more of that deliberate um, you know, outcome of what you're doing. And that's what makes an explorer an explorer that you're, you're learning through life but you still find ways to apply it to what you're doing um, and you know, using that to help you grow with it. And when we look at um, people that are explorers, when you look at the icons of industry, you know, be it you know, any, you know, any of the executives that are out there that you know, have trillion dollar companies, mm -hmm. um, when you look at um, a number of musicians, they are well versed in a number of things. They don't just know one thing. Um, even if you look at sports, a lot of great athletes are great at many sports and they cross train. Mm -hmm. They don't just do one thing. And so when you start to look at all the individuals that are great within their respective fields, not just business, but in education, they know a lot of different um, they know a lot of information about a lot of different topic areas, um, design, sports. They're able to pull from their backgrounds to be better at you know where um, they're focused. So instead of a specialist, can you know they're the best at what they do. A generalist or an explorer, they know a number of different topics, mm -hmm. and so they know two or three areas, and maybe they're in the top twenty-five percent you know, of their respective fields. So that makes it more accessible to a number of us, you know, that aren't the best at it. Um, but it, like I said, it allows us to pull from our backgrounds and um, based on our experiences to do um, to do the best work possible. So I I have a question for both of you. So as a as our our MetroStar design manager and then as the director of experience strategy, how do you see the um, the topic of explorers applied to design and technology? Good. Jason, I'll let you answer first as our <laughs> guest. <laughs> yeah, I put you oh. on the spot. I was like, oh, they moved, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, so when we look at technology, the field is changing, you know, year over year. Um, you know, even if we just look at, um, you know, how technology has changed over the advent of the pandemic, um, the remote conferencing capabilities have skyrocketed. Uh, because people need to communicate and collaborate, you know, with that, and that was something that came out of nowhere, um, you know, with that. So when we look at how does 
uh, this idea of an explorer come into technology, it's being able to understand the environment around you mm -hmm. and know enough about all the different pieces in those uh, building blocks that I was talking about earlier to have empathy for what uh, individuals are going through, what their challenges are, and not having to rely on um, the, their comfort zone. Uh, they don't just go back and do the same thing over and over again and say, well, I did this over here and it's good enough for what I'm doing here. They're able to go deep enough to understand the problems that they're trying to solve for, mm -hmm. the technology and the roles and limitations that it plays, and who else needs to be involved? So it's that combination of those three areas coming together um, that make, in my mind, a successful designer and how they're able to leverage um, enough of the discipline of design to come up with ideas that are specifically tailored to what the problem is they're looking to solve. And don't rely on, um, like I said, the historical um, ideas they've come up with or you know things that don't connect with uh, the audience they're building it for. Yeah, I mean, I would echo exactly what Jason is saying. I think the success comes from, um, it's very much like the agile ceremonies, right? Mm -hmm. We've gone through and done uh, a series or a cycle. So in our retro, right, when we come uh, up against that problem again, that is similar enough, it doesn't have to be exactly, but we have a basis of, oh, that worked well, that did it, and it's informing us for the next. Um, I think that's what you would get out of the Explorer is that continual application of all of our past experiences to continue to, you you know, I love this word, to iterate on life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was just exactly what you were saying. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great uh, point with that. And it, it's taking, you know, that foundation of saying, okay, I have these, these experiences that mm -hmm. I can pull from, but it's having um, the intuition or the ability to say, what's different about this? Mm -hmm. How do we need to adapt this to fit what we're doing um, as part of it? And that comes through experience and wisdom because you've seen it, uh, but to say, okay, I know there's something different. How do we adapt it? How do we adjust it? Um, and then when we look at kind of the roles involved in design, there's, an umbrella when people say user experience design. <laughs> well, that could be everything from research to development in some cases. And then it's honing in on, well, okay, what is really the area of design that um, you know the individual is um, experienced with? And then helping them to understand the different pieces. So some people are more analytical, so <laughs> they're drawn you know, maybe to the research side of it. Um, other people are more creative and they're drawn, obviously, to the UI and the other um, parts of it. But then it's helping them to understand where are the areas they can grow into. So if you're looking at research, well, you need to do synthesis of that research and you need to come up with uh, a strategy and direction and recommendations. Mm -hmm. So that takes some creative thought to do that. Um, if you're more on the visual side, then it's trying to be maybe more analytical and structured in your thinking and what you're solving for. So that all comes through that exploration. And with all the resources that are available to us nowadays, um, you know, I'd say that's one of the few benefits you know, of the pandemic is there's a lot of online uh, learning opportunities mm -hmm. that have come out of it, where now you can explore and you can expand what your um, what your knowledge is, what your knowledge base is, to be able to build off of those skills you have and complement them. So then it's you're more versatile and you're able to understand the different pieces of the field and how they all fit together as we're going about and doing uh, the work that we're doing. I love that you said that with, um, you know, being able to look online and find different resources. That's something that you always say, like, look at YouTube, look at different yeah. things. Like if you want to learn how to use XYZ software, you're you're always like, just go online, like Google it, look at videos on it and just like dip your toe in it and see how it is. So you're very like. Yeah, we talked about that on the episode with Tiffany um, last season, too. And like you were saying, 
we know like the foundation of this problem, but like what's different um, I like I Google all the time and it's like the most plain language of something to Google. But you would be so surprised that someone has written something. And I know I found a couple of topics that there wasn't really great information, but could at least see enough to, you know, use past experiences, be able to talk about it with um, our various team members and we got somewhere and it worked out. But, you know, as an explorer, sometimes you're not so sure about your track. <laughs> exactly. Um, but we made it. <laughs> yep, you figure it out. Yeah. And I was just going to say that's the sign of a great explorer that you take that first step mm -hmm. yeah. and you recognize that, OK, here's something I don't know. I need to do some research and learn a little bit about it um, to make my next decision. So we're fortunate in this day and age to be able to get on Google and have this wealth of resources. But, you know, I'd say for anybody, um, regardless if it's um, uh, going on to Google, online, YouTube, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, spending five hours a week learning something that you don't know or that's more interesting that you want to learn more about is just a lifelong trait that should be instilled mm -hmm. you know across anybody um, because you're constantly learning you're expanding your basis of what you know and you're challenging what you don't know and any you know preconceived notions that you might have so you're being more worldly and it's going to make you more relatable and understandable but also more employable is part of it uh, when you look at um, you know, more traits of an explorer, it's the ability to converse with many different people. So how do you take what you understand and what it is you're trying to do and communicate that to a CEO, to a developer, uh, to just a general person, you know, out in the world that doesn't know anything about what you're talking about? Um, being able to uh, converse with all these different backgrounds it makes you a better person, mm -hmm. uh, and not just a conversationalist, um, but it helps you do your job more effectively and uh, just be um, you know, that much more open and understanding to different areas that design can help to improve. So on that same token, do you have uh, any tips or tricks that, um, for leaders so that they can empower their teams to be more of explorers? Having, having that openness is uh, critical. You know, it goes to the culture of the organization um, you know, that you're a part of with it. So leaders really need to create that forum that uh, opens up the ability for people to talk and share about these ideas and these topics that they're learning. Mm -hmm. They need to create a space where it's welcome and it's open and it can be discussed. Uh, with it. So um, many companies have been forced, you know, into working remotely, um, you know, through uh, the pandemic, but it's still finding ways to force that conversation in an open and safe spot uh, because those, those forums and those topics discussed are going to trigger other people to ask questions and be inspired. And that's what it comes down to that the world around us is changing and it's changing on a daily basis. And we need to have and recognize that these conversations need to happen and they're, they're a benefit to the organization that you're a part of. So having those and sharing that inspiration and motivation with those around you is a benefit for everybody. And leaders need to recognize that conversation can be messy <laughs> um, it's not, you know, all it's not roses all the time with it, but it's still in the long run, a, it's a benefit, you know, for everybody involved and it keeps people inspired mm -hmm. and motivated and, uh, mentally engaged, uh, with it. Oh, I was going to say, I think you hit it on the head about creating that safe space, right? Cause there's a sense of being vulnerable as an explorer, right? Cause I'm like, I'm going to bring up this topic. I don't know a whole lot about, but like, I'm really curious and 
Um, I know we've had conversations, not necessarily related to design, but like, did you see that headline? And yes, I only read the headline to start this conversation. <laughs> like, we'll go dive into it further, but like, you know, sometimes things come by fast, but to be able to have that safe space of, it's okay if I don't know all the facts, like we're not going to go head to head at this right now, uh, but we can talk it out and have that messy conversation and learn together. Yeah, and I think um, we've been lucky on our project with, with our PM, and you know we can. And Metro Star has a program for for um, for training, so people can do. Um, it, you know, there's a budget for people to do training mm-hmm. if they want to take a particular course and and like, be explorers. And I know that we've been lucky that we've been able to, you know, just because our focus is so. This past year, mine was on project management. This upcoming year, like. If I wanted to, you know, do AI or something, mm-hmm. you know, like a complete 180, you know, I don't have that fear of, you know, going to our PM being like, I'm going to take this yeah. course that's not in my wheelhouse at all, but you know, it looks cool and in like we're with that safe space, it's okay mm-hmm. to bring up that conversation. So I think we've been we've been very lucky with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and when you look at you know the the culture of that. Um, you know, I guess two things, you know, one is, I guess, through going back to um, how do leaders uh, facilitate and empower um, uh, those types of conversations, you know, around being an explorer, there's learning with it. And I'm sure we've all been involved in some conversation that <laughs> takes a turn and, yeah. you know, something was said, a line was crossed and people start to get frustrated they get angry, it gets personal. Uh, that's where you know having active facilitation to de-escalate it uh, before it gets to that point and recognizing if there are tensions that are escalating, how to you know separate the conversation, bring it down, mm-hmm. and keep it more about the topic and less about the personal side of it is important. <clears throat> Excuse me, but to get to that point of being able to recognize it and being proactive, you go through a lot of messy conversations <laughs> and you learn as you go because yeah. um, you're exploring with it. Uh, but there's the self-reflection as part of being an explorer that's critical of, okay, I tried this. It didn't quite work the way I expected it to. Yeah. <laughs> what would I do next time? And making sure you apply that to the next time. Mm-hmm. So when I talk about active learning, that's part of it that you don't just keep going and coming up with the same uh, problem over and over again. You try and do something different the next time mm-hmm. and mitigate what that happened. And it's through trial and error, you know, with that, you know, is um, you're helping to facilitate those conversations uh, as part of it. But then um, when you brought up the point about, um, you know, kind of where you're learning and coming from, you know, content to project management. You know, one of the most inspiring stories is um, there was an individual that came in uh, from a background in psychology, got into recruiting, and then came into content and then got into analytics. And seeing the progression of their career and how it's changed was truly inspiring Mm -hmm. because you know, they had a good foundation, you know, with, um, you know, a degree in psychology, you can do many things with it, but they kept learning and honing what it was that really motivated and inspired them. But then they were able to bring it back and apply it to the work that we do Mm -hmm. um, and the field. And it just made them even better what they did and uh, provided, you know, so much value and inspiration, you know, as part of it. And that's something you want to instill, you know, in anybody that um, you're not set into this rigid box and you can never change. Mm -hmm. If I look at where I was at 18 to mid 20s, 30s, and now in my 40s, I think everything that I've learned has helped to shape who I am today. And if I would have made certain decisions early on, I wouldn't be who I am or I wouldn't be happy. Mm-hmm. Or I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing as part of it. And that's all been part of that learning and exploring um, aspect of what we've been talking about. 
So to uh, kind of bring things full circle with where we started about some of your friends having their kids go to college, what advice do you have for people? And, you know, I think parents, sometimes they influence what children do and stuff like that, or, you know, um, caregivers, because you, you know, you want to impress your caregiver or whatever. Um, what advice do you have for people that are kind of like told, like, you should be a specialist right after, right after, after graduation or, you know, grad, um, you know, if you go through a program or anything like that for uh, trade, what advice do you have to kind of like buck against that? Yeah, that's uh, that's a tough one. The the biggest one is why. Mm -hmm. What is the benefit of doing that? Um, and understanding really the the core of what's driving it. Um, but then, while there might be value, and there are people that might be ready to specialize, you know, at that time, it's doing as my parents told me. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to take that business class? <laughs> um, you know, it, parent, parental lessons come full circle. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's the conversation of why. And then looking at there's these other things that are going to help you as much. So don't be in a rush to specialize as part of it. Learn all these other things so then they're going to help you. Where if you do decide this is something that you want to go down and the path you want to go down, it's going to, one, help you be um, more well-rounded as you go down that path. It's going to reinforce that is really the career path for me. So you don't get to a point in your 30s where you're starting to question, why did I do that? And then you do a career change at that point in your life. And not that there's anything wrong with it. Uh, people do it all the time. But it gets to be a little harder as you do get older. Mm -hmm. So it's recognizing that that you know when you're young, you're more able and free to make mistakes. Yeah. And you're able, you have these flexibilities before they have bigger impacts, you know, to your life, where maybe, you know, you have a family, you have a mortgage, mm -hmm. these things that tend to settle you down and force you down this path because you have responsibilities. So taking advantage of that time that you do have. And then that'll reinforce that lifelong exploring aspect of it, but maybe give you a little more um, structure and um, understanding of really where your passion is before you have to settle down. Awesome. Yeah, I would totally agree. I feel like, I don't know, like coming out of school or even before, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's always like the firefighter, doctor, lawyer. Uh, I didn't want to be any of those. And then not knowing, I love what I do now, but, you know, I might have without the responsibilities of a family and stuff, maybe like done like a side soap baking business or something, you know, where now it's like running around with my kid and don't mm -hmm. have those extra hours. So, but yeah, and just now, now that I had the new responsibility of a baby, I'm like, oh, I gotta be focused. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's. Um, I think that we've all benefited from being a little bit of, a, you know, having the best of both worlds, specializing in some things, generalizing in others. Mm -hmm. But I think also all of us have been explorers. I mean, you've like you hired both of us. You've seen <laughs> us, you know, grow yeah. in different ways and go on different paths, but still, you know, be. Um, being able to take on different tasks just because we have sort of that generalist and specialist view. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, well, first off, we want to thank you for for joining us. For thank you for having me. Our podcast and uh, something new that we're doing for season two is we're asking all of our guests a question. So uh, what is the most promising thing you've seen uh, with the progression of design and government? Wow. I know. It's not a song, <laughs> but I know. <laughs> Um, that, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, there's so much with that. Um, but I think, you know, before, before I can answer that, it's going back uh, to the beginning. I started working um, in ad agencies and going through there on the commercial side of uh, the industry before coming into government and technology. But I remember coming into government and technology, it was probably within the first three weeks, uh, working with a customer and them essentially saying that, I don't care about any of this. You're the expert. 
I just need you to go back and do it. And the whole conversation was around the inclus- inclusivity aspect of it of, okay, you know, we're, we're doing this for you, you know, for um, your users, uh, for your employees, and let's work through it together. Uh, mm-hmm. So we understand what the challenges are, what you're looking to get out of it, um, and really how do we address what keeps you up at night? And you're know, trying to be a trusted partner. So when they came back with, you're the expert, go figure it out. <laughs> of course, I could go figure it out. Uh, you know, I had the resources. We have the foundation where we could go do the research and everything on our own. But what we like to do is bring the customers along with us. So we help to educate them. Mm-hmm. So we help to inform them about why were decisions being made and what is the value of doing one thing over another. So that helps to improve everything around that whole ecosystem that we're working with. So hearing that, you know, was kind of a reset for me of, okay, I'm not in the industry that I was, and I need to help to uh, reframe my conversations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, So the people I'm working with understand what we're doing, the value of what we're doing. So bringing this full circle into what is the most promising thing about design, it is the realization of the value of design that's most exciting to me. And it's not that everybody has to know what design is, but it's saying that the path that we've gone down isn't working quite the way we thought, or there's a better way to do it. And then here is a different way. So I'm going to find somebody that can help me do that better way, Mm -hmm. that different way is part of it. So by having them just ask, well, how do we get design involved? What would it what would you do differently? That is the foundation for making things better. And that's really the hope for where things are going. And we're seeing a lot of momentum Mm -hmm. around people asking for design from the work we're doing, uh, new work coming out, from the executive order that came out on customer experience um, at the end of December. There's a lot of discussions around it, but now the next step is helping to have them understand what does design really mean Mm -hmm. and how do you do it well versus just talk about it. Because now a lot of people are gonna be saying that they do design when they maybe don't. Mm -hmm. So that'll maybe be for my second <laughs> second podcast. We'll talk about good design versus yeah. bad design. How to actually do it. <laughs> Ooh, I feel like I can put you two in the hot seat for that. I'll just listen. I'll just ask the questions. Fire you. Fire. It's yeah. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much for joining us. This has been great. I feel like we have another podcast topic waiting to happen. Uh, yep, that's a sign of a good podcast, right? Yeah. There's another one that comes out of it and a continuation. Exactly. Well, with that, uh, this is Mocket. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends and join us next time. If you're interested in, in learning more about how tech and government collide, visit metrostar.com and follow us on our socials.